Hello, we're now going to talk about the argument principle, which is really what we were building towards when we introduced this argument function thing. Um, so once again, we're going to be talking about um, complex functions f of s, um, taking points in some input copy of the complex plane and producing points in some output copy of the complex plane. And again, we're going to be looking at curves and what happens when we input particular curves. Uh, but this time we're going to look at closed curves. And in particular, we're going to look at curves that encircle some bounded region. So we're going to have some region R of our input space, and it's bounded. There are no holes in it. Um, and then what we're going to do is for our contour gamma, it's going to be some closed curve that walks around the boundary exactly once. So I have in mind something like that. So this is our contour this time, uh, gamma. And it's a closed curve. So it, we sort of pick some arbitrary place for it to start, and it goes all the way around um, back to where it started. So what happens when we put this through our function? Well, we just get some other closed curve. So um, as we saw last time, points get mapped into other points, and if we have some curve, it'll get mapped into a curve. And this time, because the curve finishes where it starts, the same will be true for the curve we get in the output space. And again, this will have some direction. And so let's just denote this by f of gamma. So this is what our curve looks like when we input every single point on this curve closed loop, um, this closed curve gamma. And so what does the argument principle say? Well, the argument principle says that something about this, the argument function of uh, this function f, is defined. Um, based just in terms of properties of the, the function f. And this, more specifically, this is what it says. It says that the number of anti-clockwise, so that's our convention for positive argument, remember. So anti, number of anti-clockwise encirclements of the origin um, yeah, by f of gamma is equal to the number of zeros subtracted, and then we subtract the number of poles of our function f of s in the region R. So what does that mean? It just, it's just telling us that the number of poles and zeros that our function f of s has within the region R completely determines the number of encirclements that our function will make um, of the origin. So let's just unpack that. Um, so what does that tell us about this setup here? Well, we have a contour going in the anti-clockwise direction, and we got out another contour that encircles the origin in the anti-clockwise direction one time. And this, and so this, from the argument principle, this tells us that we must have one more zero than pole of our function f of s in this region r. So it's possible that our function f of s has one zero. Typically, you denote zeros in the complex plane with little circles and poles with crosses. So it could be possible that our function has exactly one zero in the region R, or we could have two zeros, but if we have two zeros, then there must be a pole. I give up on this pen. So yeah, so to just draw that on again with a pen that actually works, we could have one zero, um, or we could have two zeros, but if we have two zeros, then we must have a pole. We don't know where these zeros and poles are, but we know for sure that they're in the region R. Um, and this is always true. So whatever region R we picked, it would define a new curve 
gamma, and you might encircle different numbers of poles and zeros of the function f of s, but then um, the output contour will change the number of anti-clockwise encirclements it makes of the origin accordingly. So let's just do another kind of example to illustrate this, because I mean, this is kind of a simple curve. Let's just draw another copy of the complex plane here. And suppose we didn't get this nice simple looking output curve, we instead got something really horrible. And maybe we will. Let's say this is f of gamma instead. What will this tell us? Um, so just by how can we count encirclements um, in this case? And how are we and, and what can we deduce about the numbers of zeros and poles that the function f must have? So first of all we need a better way to count encirclements. So it was sort of okay in this for this region here we could easily see that we had one anti-clockwise encirclement. How about in this case? Well what in order to count encirclements, and this works not just for the origin but general points, is what we do is we start at the point we're interested in and we draw out some line. It doesn't have to be a straight line but the line has to go on out to infinity. And then what we do is we investigate how our curve cuts this line and we can use this to count the number of encirclements. So what we do is we we say, okay, I'm starting on my curve here, and now I just move along it and I wait until I cross. So I move along, move along, move along, and then I find I get one crossing here. It's going in the clockwise direction. I move along, move along, follow the curve, follow the curve, and then I've got another cutting also in the clockwise direction. And I can actually see that there are no more. I've accounted for all of my cuttings. If I follow the curve, I'll eventually get back to where I started. And this method is guaranteed to tell me the number of encirclements and their sense. So here I've got two clockwise encirclements. So what does that mean? It means that the number of anti-clockwise encirclements of the origin is minus two. And so that means I must have two more poles than zeros. So this pole zero configuration is not possible. Um, we would have to have, we could have two poles, we could have three poles and one zero, four poles and two zeros, and so on. And so this is what the argument principle um, tells us. It gives us some way to relate the number of zeros and poles in a region R to the encirclements made by the output. Um, we're by the function evaluated on the, the boundary of the region. And we're going to use this to prove the Nyquist stability criterion in the next lecture. But let's just do a quick kind of intuitive derivation of the argument principle using the argument function that we defined last time. So what would the argument function let us do? The argument function allows us to compute the change in the argument of the output of a function when evaluated on a particular contour. So the argument function is going to allow us to describe this thing here. And how would we do that? Well, if we integrated our argument function, you put this circle on to indica indicate um, closed contours. So our argument function was just f dash over f ts then this would be equal to the change in the argument as you move along the contour um, gamma. And here we're, we're interested in numbers of encirclements, so we, we should actually divide by 2 pi. So a change in argument of 2 pi would correspond to one anti-clockwise encirclement. So in particular, we see these things are equal. The number of anti-clockwise encirclements of the origin made by f evaluated on the contour gamma is equal to our argument function when integrated on the curve um, omega. And remember we had an imaginary part in here, um, but we just keep the imaginary parts outside everything. Um, so that's fine. Um, and now 
how can we relate this to the numbers of zeros and poles? Well, let's just assume that we have the following particular form for our function f. So f is equal to, let's say it takes the following general form. So we have s minus z1, s minus z2, and these are all of the zeros of our function inside the region r. And similarly, we have for all the poles, so there might be more, there might not just be two. We've got p1, s minus p2, and so on. All of this multiplied by g of s. So f, a general form for our function f of s is this bit, which has got all the zeros and poles in our region r, and then some other function which contains whatever else was in f of s, but it has no zeros or poles in this region here. And let's just take the, the log of this um, to see what we get. Log of f of s is equal to, and then whenever you take logs of products, things split into sums, and whenever you divide by things, they become minus. So log of f of s is equal to the sum of s minus zi, and we sum over all of the poles, uh, sorry, all of the zeros in our region r. And from this, we take away the sum of all of our poles inside the region r. And then here, we've just got log of everything that's left. And if you remember last time, the log of f of s was related to f dash over f, and in particular, it was re related by differentiating. So d by ds of log of f of s is f dash over f, and that's easy to check for yourself. So let's um, just differentiate this with respect to s. d by ds of log of f of s. Well, we just differentiate all of the... Um, oh, I forgot all the logs. Yeah, you probably spotted this. It's not just s minus z, there's logs. So if we take the log of this expression, we get the, the, the log, or the multiplication splits into a summation, but we have to keep the logs in there. Um, and so what happens if I differentiate log of s minus z i? I get 1 over s minus z i, so I have a summation over i, and I get the same thing for the p's, I get 1 over s minus pk, and then here I have g dash over g. Um, and in particular, this has got no poles and zeros in our region r. All of our poles and zeros now correspond to poles of f dash over f, and they're given by these expressions here. And now we can just evaluate this integral with um, the residue theorem. So hopefully you've come across the residue theorem in some complex analysis. It's one of the first results that you learn. I'll give some link in case you've not seen that before. So we know f dash over f is equal to this thing here, which is equal to this thing here. And we can now evaluate this integral using the residue theorem. And if we do that, we find that the imaginary part, and when we normalize with 1 over 2 pi, so if I take this integral, look at the imaginary part, well, I get the number of zeros, and that's coming from this summation here. The residue ends up giving me 1 for each zero in the region R. And similarly, I take one away for each one of the poles. And because the function has no pole, this has no poles or zeros in the region R, when we integrate on, along the closed contour, this term just vanishes again by the residue theorem. And so there we have it. We have a sort of a, a quick sloppy derivation of the argument principle and also, but more importantly, the explanation for the argument principle itself, which gives you a way to relate the number of zeros in poles in some region r to the number of encirclements 
made by the output of the function of the origin. Um, and now we're going to use this to derive the Nyquist criterion.